So Keith, welcome to Upstream Livestream in the Super Union studio. Really pleased to be here. It's amazing offices. Well, thank you. It's, it really is our great pleasure to have you here. Uh, our guests on Upstream Livestream are all people who, in some way or another, we would consider to be champions of creativity in business or in some form of social enterprise. Uh, but I have to say, I, I, I think your achievements stand out as remarkable, even among uh, that, that kind of illustrious company. Um, an amazing list of things that you've been a part of through your career. You were the inventor of Air Miles, created not just a business, but, but, but I'd say a whole category, founder of Nectar, the reward scheme. You're the man who led the team that brought the 2012 Olympic Games to London. And then you're the deputy chair of the team that delivered those magnificent games in London. Um, you're the chair of Invictus Games, which is an initiative that's very close to our hearts as well, but, but another magnificent thing. And you're also the chair of the Royal Foundation of the Duke and Duch Duchess of Cambridge and the Duke and Duchess of Sussex. It's an incredible array of things that you're, you're a part of. And, and I'm, I'm interested in that journey. How's that journey unfolded for you? And, and what, if anything, are the kind of principles or learnings that you've taken um, from that through that amazing period of time? Well, I mean, I have been very lucky. And I have to say, luck, as always, plays a big part in somebody's career. Um, uh, and I, but I actually started in, in, in the media and, and advertising businesses. So sort of creativity has been at the heart of, of uh, what I've done. Although I have to say, I'm not an art director or a copywriter. Um, uh, although I've had to manage some of them, and that can be a challenge sometimes. Um, but I, I think the... I, you know, I was lucky enough um, to start a business very early on in my career, and and when you start a business, you um, understand at the sharp end what needs to happen if you're going to uh, engage people, and that's not just selling to them; it's sort of capturing their hearts and minds, and whether it's uh, in a client relationship, as you have clients here, um, uh, or with the general public. Um, uh, most people that I come across um, that uh, that have success are able to um, uh, paint a picture uh, because people buy ideas. And you know, I've been fortunate enough to be around a number of projects where the core idea was strong, whether it be Air Miles or Nectar, or even the way in which we pitched um, to the IOC uh, London as a host city for the London Olympic Games. It 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 uh, the, the core was an idea and. Uh, and that's sort of been something I've been with throughout my career. Mm. That's a, with something we believe in really strongly as well as is the power of ideas. Um, do you think the nature of ideas that work in those contexts has changed over time? And media's changing all the time, consumer behavior's changing all the time, society's unfolding, developing in different ways. Do you think ideas are changing, the things that work? Uh, no, I don't think, I mean, I think the way we consume ideas is changing. Clearly, social media has made a, a massive impact uh, on that. But the core ideas themselves, I don't think have, have changed. You, you know, trying to engage and inspire um, amuse sometimes, uh, educate um, people, whether it be in a business-to-business -business environment or uh, amongst the general public. I don't think that itself has changed. Uh, the general public and businesses that I see are still engaged when a new idea comes along that, that captures their imagination. They just consume it in a different way. And what, what, what are the characteristics of a really strong idea for you? What do you look for when you're, when you're trying to find those, those, those breakthrough moments? Well, it, I, I guess it's Firstly, whatever it is has to be authentic. You know, it has to be real. It can't just be manufactured. There has to be some substance behind it, um, and there has to be a reason why. You know, a need, either a, in the context of a, uh, a product, you know, a need for that product, um, or in the context of something like the Olympic Games. You know, why would 150 people, the IOC members, vote for London when they could choose New York? Paris, uh, Moscow, Madrid, uh, uh, all great cities. Well, what was it that differentiated London? And actually they bought an idea. And our, our idea was that we would use the games to inspire a generation of young people. And in fact, we took in our final pitch to Singapore, 35 young people from the East End of London and said the future of the world is the next generation. And if you give us the games, we'll use those games to inspire the next generation. And I'm sure that was one of a, you know, a number of reasons that, uh, that got us over the line in Singapore. Mm. 
those Olympic Games in 2012 were just magnificent. And I've, I've lived in London for um, well over, over 30 years now. And I have to say there was that period in the summer of several weeks that was just the best experience of London that, that I've ever had. Um, just truly magnificent. There was a sense of energy and, 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 and I think more than anything, positivity. I mean, people, you know, being happy and talking to each other on the tube and, and just being really engaged with the whole experience. And, and in some ways, I, I, that was almost unexpected for me. I hadn't anticipated that that was going to, to, to be the spirit that surrounded the games. And it's such an amazing achievement. But at the same time, I mean, we talk about the power of, of the idea, and it is a magnificent idea, but the task of delivering that must have been absolutely gargantuan. And uh, what were the challenges? How did you overcome the challenges of delivering all that and retaining that integrity? Well, there are two, two aspects of it. One, one is uh, capturing the hearts and minds of the people in this country, um, which we talked about earlier. Uh, and the other is the practical delivery of it. When we started the bid, 48% of the population in the UK thought it was a really bad idea that we were bidding and really didn't want the Olympic Games to come to London. So that's how, that was our starting point. By the time we got to Singapore, um, we managed to move that up to close to 80%. Um, uh, but then having won it, and having reached a positive consumer approval for bidding, uh, uh, the country then went into, as it often does, mostly, I'd have to say, by the, uh, by the media in this country, into, oh my goodness, uh, we know this is going to cost more money than it should have done, and it's probably going to be late because we can't do these things. Uh, sort of a, uh, the, the whole country seemed to uh, lose its confidence in our ability to deliver it. Uh, but we built that, I mean, it's a seven-year period from the time you um, know you've won uh, an Olympic bid through to delivering the Games. and. Um, and it was a long, hard slog to turn public opinion uh, to really get behind the games. And I knew um, we'd achieve that um, about three months out from the games themselves when the uh, Seb and I went to Olympia to light the Olympic torch. We brought it back to Land's End and one of my buddies, Ben Ainsley, was the first runner. And, uh, and I jumped on the truck with all the cameras on it in front of the torchbearer, the runner. And we worked our way through the little lanes in Cornwall and some of the towns in Cornwall. And during the day, the crowds built and built and built. And there were, you know, kids that are no older than two or three years old and, and uh, people in their 80s and 90s on the street. And all they were cheering on was a torch, nothing else. Mm -hmm. And by the time we got to Plymouth, 55,000 people were in the centre of Plymouth to welcome the torch. And, and I called Seb uh, on the mobile and said, you know, I think they've got it. It's going to be fine. This is going to be just fine. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, and as you say, the atmosphere just built through London. And I think everyone was just generally very proud at what we had achieved. And, and uh, you know, the uh, whether it's the the games makers that we uh, recruited 70,000 volunteers that were out there and their attitude uh, the way we staged the uh, opening ceremony which I have to say had its moments in the build-up uh, <laughs> uh, that, that um, uh, worried me but but the whole package um, really brought the country together in a positive way that we don't really see often in this country because we're quite reserved. You know, sometimes around royal weddings or, but uh, you know, there are moments and we could do with that right now. Instantly, no, given, we, could, yeah, given we, where we, we need are. the Olympic back. <laughs> uh, uh, more than one person's uh, called me and said, "Can you try and create the sort of atmosphere <laughs> that we had in the Olympic Games in the UK uh, again?" So there's an incredible marriage of of craft and commitment in that whole Olympic story over, over that seven year period with so many things to do, but but nothing for me brought alive the idea of British creativity more so than that opening ceremony, where I was actually in France on my way back from a holiday and um, saw that on the TV and was just blown away by it. It was, it, it, it was slightly madcap in places, it was wonderfully inventive, it was, it was a glorious um, uh, experience to watch, but, but how did that how did that come about? What was the process of delivering that? Well, it was. I mean, Danny Boyle obviously was the was the director and the genius uh, behind it. And logistically, pretty amazing. I mean, I think we had to uh, run auditions for about thirty thousand people to choose fifteen thousand 
that uh, actually performed on that evening. So just the practicalities, we took over an old uh, Ford parking lot in Dagenham, mm -hmm. uh, which is where we created two uh, stadium size areas where all the rehearsing got done. Um, but I think the most nerve-wracking nerve for me was when we did the first full dress rehearsal in the stadium, which is about two weeks before the opening ceremony. And Seb and I went um, uh, to see how they were getting on. And uh, we decided that Seb would go into the control room with Danny and look at it on television, because clearly you've got two audience, audiences. You've got the world, what, three and a half billion people around the world that are going to watch you on television. And then you've got the uh, impression in the stadium. So I sat outside the control room to watch uh, what was happening outside. And um, it took a long time to get through this dress rehearsal. And uh, at about 2.30 in the morning, Seb came out and sat next to me in what was now an empty stadium and said, what do you think? And I said, I don't think we're ever going to work again. <laughs> I think this is just dreadful. <laughs> it, was, it was far too long. And, um, and a lot of the segments just weren't working. They weren't tight enough. And one segment was a disaster, which actually disappeared. It was a uh, a, a segment around with we had um, quad bikes and and uh, um, mountain bikes and things that just didn't work. Um, uh, but it was, I mean, I have to say, I was I called my wife afterwards and said, you know, <laughs> I think we've really screwed Pat it up. <laughs> <laughs> just this is terrible. But you know, we had five dress rehearsals and they got better and better and better um, and and as you say on the night it you know he pulled it off and it all came together um, and it was uh, you know it was it was it was a great uh, display of British creativity um, and um, uh, and I think we're all very relieved mm, it was magnificent I mean part of it I suppose was the fact that it wasn't it didn't feel overly staged it felt like there was a naturalness to it even if there wasn't you know it felt that way i remember once working with a choreographer who um i think i think he did a lot of work with take that and 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 people a lot more interesting than i ever was but part of a show we were putting together to go somewhere and he would make us rehearse and rehearse and rehearse until it was absolutely awful because he said the only way you learn to put on a good performance is to actually do a really bad one right. so yeah well there were lots of really bad parts of the rehearsing i can i can promise you and you know just some of the things that we you know had long conversations with danny about um you know, we had a big segment on Great Ormond Street Hospital. Now, that's very important to people in this country, but three and a half billion people around the world don't know Great Ormond Street Hospital. So how do you get across uh, to that, you know, to the big wide world, the, the significance of that, that piece of the show? Um, but anyway, he did it a great job, and uh, and the, the the geniuses, the, the the queen jumping out of the helicopter, and all of those sorts of things, uh, were just brilliant. Um, and um, you know, when we picked up the newspapers the next day, we were mighty relieved. Well, I, yeah, I can imagine you could stay in the country after all. Yeah, but of course, you, you you have stayed in the country. You've moved on to do many other things. Sport has been a theme that stayed with you, and and you're a Yachtsman yourself, you mentioned Ben Ben Ainsley earlier on, but um, you've you've not won. quite not quite as good as Ben. No, Ainsley. Well, you've won the the round the world yacht race, haven't you? Yeah, I have. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that was with a team of ten, but um, yeah, well, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. ten percent at least of, <laughs> of 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 winning that. So, but sport um, plays such an important role for you now in in the work that you do. Yeah. You're about to uh, engage in a, the launch of a new. Uh, initiative yeah. that's sport related. T tell us something about that. Well, I, I, um, for most of my career, 20, 30 years of my career, um, I did not much else other than work and build businesses. Um, but when we started the Olympic uh, project in the bidding stage, one of the most important parts of, of the early stages was to get planning permission for the Olympic Park um, in East London. And that meant persuading the five London boroughs to all cooperate. And it is a sort of sign of good faith and to try and engage the, uh, the, the, the local uh, communities there, we put some really basic sports projects in. I mean, a few coaches, a few um, uh, bits of kit, and we paid for a few sports halls and just to engage the local community. And, uh, and it was a goodwill gesture, really. And what I didn't expect after about a year of doing this was the, the, the police reported back to us that street crime had dropped 25 percent in these boroughs and all we'd done was get kids off the street that's all and i have to say that's when the penny dropped for me that this was that sport had an extraordinary ability to to engage young people and change their lives and we started then to build our 
message to the IOC around young people and how sport could really change a generation. And, and that became the theme for the whole Games. And during the build-up, uh, to the games, uh, I initiated uh, uh, two or three specific projects. One was a foundation that I started myself and, and funded myself called Sported, and the other was an international version of that called International Inspiration. It was uh, two foundations that use sport to solve, solve social issues. And Sported now has between two and 3,000 community sports clubs that it uh, help support um, across the UK and uh, international inspiration. I think we got it into 20 countries and impacted about 25 million kids. It was quite quite amazing. Um, and so, the, the, uh, having seen firsthand the impact sport has uh, on young people, um, uh, I've continued to get involved in in lots of projects in that space. Um, and in fact, one project that um, your company helped us with uh, in the very early days uh, of, of, of my time with the Royal Foundation was the Invictus Games, which I now chair. You know, creating that brand um, has has had a massive impact right across the world uh, with those men and women that have been injured or wounded while serving their country. Um, but but what really made, what really brought it to life was the magic of the brand, the, 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 uh, the poem, um, the I am, um, and, um, and I've now been to uh, four Invictus Games and we're just playing the fifth in, in The Hague. And every time I, I go, I get absolutely amazed at the impact uh, that's had. Um, so, you know, I, I'm a big believer in the way that sport can transform lives. And, um, and I've been involved in lots of projects that do that. Mm, mm. And the upcoming? So we have a new one. Yes, of course we do. Um, which again, you guys have been uh, incredibly helpful um, in uh, bringing to life, and this was actually, I think, a bigger challenge than some of the other things that we've done with, uh, with, with the company, your company, um, because when we worked with you on trying to change the perception of mental health in this country, uh, creating a sort of overarching brand that could deal with the stigma around mental health, it was, it, I, I think, an easier. Uh, 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 subject because if you stopped 100 people in the street and asked them if there was an issue with mental health in this country they'd all agree. Yeah. Stop 100 people in the street and ask them what they think about community sport and you wouldn't get really any strong views um, mm -hmm. because it's sort of under the radar. Mm -hmm. So we um, uh, worked with the team here and created uh, uh, Made by Sport i.e. my life has been made by sport. And uh, next week, or the week after, in the next few days anyway, uh, we'll be launching Made by Sport with Prince Harry uh, and with Anthony Joshua and Nicola Adams and a whole bunch of uh, fantastic uh, athletes. And the object of Made by Sport is bringing together the whole sector, over 60 charities, around a campaign to change the profile of sport from being just about Premier League footballers and gold medals to being about the value of sport in the community, uh, to raise a lot more money for the sector. Uh, you know, our target's now over 50 million uh, uh, in the sector, um, to encourage more volunteers in the sector, um, uh, and to make the sector work more efficiently. And um, uh, it hasn't launched yet, but I'm really optimistic it'll make a significant impact in this country and, um, and help thousands of young people uh, improve their lives. So I'm sure it will make a, a, a huge impact and, and with all the things that we've had the privilege to engage with you on, it, it, it's our pleasure to be involved in, in um, anything that really helps to, to drive progress and, um, and positive direction uh, in society. I'm interested in your point of view about the role of business and the role of organisations generally in contributing to that. Do you think businesses are doing enough? A lot of, a lot of organisations now talk about the social purpose. Is, is enough being done to really actively engage and drive that? It's a bit patchy. I mean, in places, there are, and there have been some great um, examples. Um, uh, Justin King, who used to run Sainsbury's and is now chairing Made by Sport. Um, he uh, grabbed hold of um, active kids when he was running Sainsbury's and that made a, a big impact in getting uh, clubs and schools equipped um, with, with uh, sports equipment. Um, but it's quite patchy and, um, and but there's, uh, you know, I genuinely believe there's an incredible opportunity for 
uh, companies and and other organisations uh, to get involved uh, to get involved, particularly those organisations that have got a, a UK wide footprint. So you can imagine a retailer or a bank that have branches uh, or shops all over the country being able to engage locally with local schools and local community sports clubs and help them is uh, is going to be I think uh, I mean, we've we've got lots of interest I have to say from a, a lot of companies that are having a look at what we're doing. Um, uh, and we've got, got a lot of interest from, you know, the likes of uh, Comic Relief, who run things like Sport Relief at the BBC, and um, uh, Sport England, who are looking at making a significant financial uh, commitment. So, you know, as with all of these sort of the sort of projects that I've been doing over my uh, over my career, once you get something actually up and running. Um, it, it sort of builds on itself, and um, uh, and I'm really hopeful that Made by Sport will be a for the next three or four years be a big presence in the UK. Mm. I mean, it does feel to me, to some extent, that companies and organisations, businesses, etc., commercial enterprises are becoming more and more uh, conscious of the contribution they can make and of, and of the need to do. It. I mean, as much as anything, to appeal to the people that they want to work for them. You know, the people, their staff, their prospective talent, etc. People care about progress in society and I mean there is an argument that not enough is happening at a governmental level um, you know whether that's for economic reasons or whether that's uh, for, for, for other reasons uh, I don't know but it, it almost feels that there is a an increasing level of responsibility on businesses to be taking a wider yeah. agenda yeah. into the world now. No, no, you're absolutely right I mean and and more and more companies that I talk to you know, it is good business. You know, the CSR used to be uh, taking a little slice of your profits and dishing it out to a few charities. And uh, I think uh, smart businesses now recognise that if they're going to engage the trust of consumers, and indeed the people that work for them, uh, there needs to be a lot more substance behind it. They, they need to be good citizens themselves they need to be making a contribution whether it's uh, around the environment um, or around social issues uh, they have a real part to play and and those companies that don't get that i think will you know i think their bottom lines will start to hurt because consumers these days have a huge choice of, of products and services that they can buy uh, and they do align themselves with companies that uh, that that give back to them the community and um, so in the context of Made by Sport, you really hope that happens. Uh, and just generally, I think, uh, we, we are seeing, uh, I think, a step change in the way in which um, consumers interact with companies and, and how products and services are sold. Um, and as a, as a company, if you're not demonstrating uh, the value you're giving back to the community, then I, you know, I think you're your customers will slowly desert you. It's a very complex equation now, isn't it, that, that bonds people to to brands. Um, and and I, I'm interested, you started your career, as we mentioned earlier on, in marketing and advertising. Um, you, you've been through these many, many great uh, initiatives, and you've seen so much change. But what, what advice would you give to somebody starting their career in marketing and advertising um, uh, today? Somebody said to me a long time ago, you know, you've got two ears and one mouth and uh, listen twice as much as you speak. And, uh, you know, I think that um, creativity comes from absorbing information uh, and then making some sense of it. Um, and whether you're you know, a writer or an art director or you're an account person looking after uh, clients' businesses, um, if you can't listen, um, you can't interpret and the creative process in my experience is simply listening to uh, the customers and the market and 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 translating that into uh, into an idea mm -hmm. and as I said earlier on you know my entire career has been about creating ideas um, and then presenting them to the public or to to, to other businesses uh, and that's what um, that's for, particularly in an early business. Um, that's what people will buy into. If you, I, I remember, you know, air miles and customer loyalty programs didn't exist um, uh, before I dreamt up air miles. Mm -hmm. um, persuading a large number of companies uh, simultaneously to adopt air miles and issue a currency that had never been issued before, you know, was a pretty big challenge I and mean, it was a new idea mm. but it was a strong idea and they bought the idea and and, and thankfully it was successful. Mm.
Mm. I often feel with creativity, and I think Invictus Games and the work, the work that, that we did around the identity for that is a good example of this, that often the answers are there, you've just got to find them. Yes. It's the finding of the answer that's the hard bit in, in, in some ways. I mean, we discovered a little typographic idea, really, yeah. within, a, within a poem that right. uh, um, allowed us to, to build an identity out of that. Um, but I think in many cases, creativity is not necessarily about you know, alchemy. Um, so much as editing out all the things that are that are not the idea, I yeah. suppose. But I think one of the things that I do think is remarkable about everything that you've achieved is one thing to have the idea. It is another thing to be able to deliver that idea at scale. I mean, yes. that that is astonishing. As you said, with Air Miles, you had the idea, then you persuaded people to do that. Yeah. You know, if you look again at the Olympics, you had the idea, then you persuaded <laughs> yes. a notoriously difficult group of people to vote for it and support it, and then you persuaded the British public to align behind that. I mean, that's a, that's a skill in itself, isn't it, for creative people? Well, it, it, uh, I, I get approached because I um, established lots of businesses and still have a number of businesses um, by uh, entrepreneurs with business ideas. And, and there are some very good ideas, but very few of them have really thought about how they're going to scale it. Um, and you're, you're absolutely right. That is the difference between a good idea uh, and an idea that becomes uh, uh, both profitable and scalable. And with Air Mars, actually, uh, going back to, uh, to, to, to that uh, challenge, um, uh, the only way I could think of to persuade, I needed you know, a dozen or 15 very large companies all to agree to sign contracts to launch Air Mars on one day, uh, which was not insignificant. And so having signed an agreement with British Airways as my partner in the UK, um, I chartered Concord for the day and sent Concord tickets uh, to about 60 companies, to the CEOs of 60 companies that I targeted could be partners of ours. And I invited them to come to a presentation in Bordeaux. Um, uh, they knew nothing about what they were coming to Bordeaux for. Uh, they didn't the, need to. <laughs> but they had a Concord ticket. And, um, and the day was organized meticulously. So a chauffeur-driven car arrived at their house to pick them up. They were taken to a special terminal, Heathrow. They were on Concorde, they arrived. They didn't need passports when they arrived in Bordeaux. They got on two coaches, they were taken to a chateau. Uh, they were given a one-hour presentation on what Air Mars was gonna be like. And then a spectacular five-course lunch with the best wines. And then I stood up uh, at the end of this lunch and said, you'll notice there is one company from each sector of the market in this room today. And you've just seen a new, what we think will be groundbreaking idea called Air Miles. Um, you now have three weeks to let us know whether you'd like to be our exclusive partner in your sector before we go and talk to your competitors. Yeah. Um, and so these poor devils uh, were faced with the prospect of saying no it being successful and it going to their competitor and being fired, yeah. or saying yes and it being a disaster, in which case they'd get fired. So they were, we were putting, and we signed 15 contracts off the back of that trip. Um, so you have to find a way of taking an idea and scaling it quickly. Um, and, and that is a challenge. Invictus Games is another example where, you know, from the first cup of tea I had with Prince Harry, uh, would you, when he explained to me what idea he had, uh, to the full-scale international games was ten months. Um, wow! Uh, which is you know was nothing. We had mm. no money. Mm. We had no brand. Mm. We had no money. No brand. No people. Nothing. Um, but if you have a strong idea, um, it's it's amazing how you can very quickly galvanise. So the first issue in that particular uh, context was we had no money for venues. But, but all the venues were in the Olympic Park, but they were very expensive. Um, I got to know Boris Johnson quite well and said to Prince Harry, first thing we've got to do uh, is to get Boris to give us all the venues for nothing. Um, and uh, uh, he said, well, how do, we do, how do we do that? And I said, you invite him to Kensington Palace for a cup of tea and I'll sit with you and you explain to him what your idea is and I'll tell him what the games are going to be about and then we'll ask him for the venues and he'll say yes and then he'll ask you for a favour because that's the way the world works. Mm. And 
Uh, and he, you know, Boris bought into the the idea. Of the, it wasn't called Invictus Games then; mm. it had no brand then. Um, uh, but he bought into the idea, and progressively, as we you know, we signed a contract with Jaguar Land Rover uh, without a brand. They bought into the idea, um, and then as soon as we announced the brand, uh, everyone got behind it, and and in ten months we had a big international competition. Right, amazing lessons in there for me on creativity with confidence. Yes. You know, it's one thing to have the idea. You've got to deliver it. You've it's got a, to but it's, it. it's got to be authentic. You know, if, if there are lots, well, we see them every day on television and in social media, um, uh, ideas, brands, new products. But if they're not really authentic, you know, they generally fall by the wayside. That feels like a really good place to leave it. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on Upstream Livestream. It's been an absolute pleasure. You're very welcome.